Welcome to um, what I think is the last panel of the conference, uh, Geons, Quantum Form, and Singularities, an, introdu an introduction to space-time engineering. <laughs> uh, this is the 16th year, I believe, of, um, of, a, of the uh, everything you wanted to know about software reliability, but I'm afraid to ask. And this origin and this started out in, 19, in 1997, I believe, with the, with the idea that that uh, that um, it would be a good idea to to, to have to have a direct uh, um, conversation between between uh, um, people uh, people who've been in the software reliability area for a while and uh, and all of the and all of the attendees to to. Um, uh, to exchange information, uh, see what see what the uh, see what the concerns were, uh, what were what were people doing, and 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 just and just, uh, and just uh, get the knowledge just get the knowledge out there as broadly uh, as possible. So the way that this panel has uh, has worked in the past, and the way that we're going to run today, is there's there's no there's no presentations, no position statements. Uh, simply uh, members of the audience uh, asking questions or or, make, or, or, make, or or making comments or or, me, or members of or members of the panel starting or, or members of the panel making comments. Um, you can address uh, questions to to in, to anyone on the panel or individual panel members or or whatever you like. So. What I'll, what I'll do at this point is uh, is uh, step back, and why don't we go ahead and get started? I think what I'll do is is uh, is uh, start out with a uh, start out with a question to uh, to all of us panelists, which which is uh, um, you know since since the since we since we got started with this panel in 1997, there there's been there's been a lot of advances and new and new, and new techniques developed. Uh, uh, Quite a lot more, quite a lot more experience in practice, and in, and if the and if the panelists have any thought on on, on what on what the most significant uh, advances are, what the what the most significant open questions still are, uh, what they think has worked the best or what hasn't worked the best, and why, uh, that uh, that might be a good way to start out, and and at, and at any and at any time, uh, any any one of you. Who, like to who like to jump in, um, please do. That's uh, that's what this is for. Uh, Pete, do you want to get us started out? Well, I, I think we, we reinvent a lot of stuff and rebrand it. But you know, cloud is cloud computing is is very sexy now. But you know, before that, it was. Uh, Clients, we used to call it client server, you know, and before that we used to call it RJE. It's turned off. So, so I think there's. It's not these these kinds of things that I think have changed a whole lot. I, I think we go through cycles with those things, but I, I do think the customers are getting much more sophisticated and much more demanding, and I I, I perceive that as a real. Um, evolutionary change that is, is headed in one direction. I mean, the, the, there's the expectation that what we produce uh, be, uh, be very error free. And uh, a lot more of what we do is found in mission critical work. So, uh, you know, the old fashioned, you know, uh, oh, just reboot the machine and, and, and start over again, that sort of um, modus operandi is, is not is not getting very far with most products these days. They have to work. They have to work in a distributed fashion. And they have to work extremely well. So we, we I, I believe we have more pressure on us now to to satisfy customers, and their expectations rise every year. Um, um, so I, I I perceive that as a real change that. Uh, is, is very challenging for us because we sometimes get stuck in old in old modes and old processes and stuff and we, we 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 you know we have to push our teams to 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 get with it to get into the 21st century 
and that that makes our jobs even more difficult to, to deliver the kind of liability that's expected of us. It is not an easy question. I think that we, we when we say we in this conference, uh, there is a lot of work about um, product, uh, qualification, software, uh, reliability <coughs> assessment, testing, and so on. Sanctions are related to the product itself. And if we look to standards, they are more or less all working on the, on the process, qualification, and so on. And I think that one of the challenges we have is to help uh, in pushing towards qualification of the product instead of the process. And, uh, and this is one of the challenges we have. Uh, and it would be hard for us to do it. Well, I, I think uh, we uh, ought to shift our focus on software reliability and availability during operation rather than all during development and testing. And uh, I think there is beginning to be a good deal of understanding of this issue and it's based on this classification of bugs into bold bugs, mandel bugs and aging related bugs. I am not sure whether there are clear uh, definitions that people are all satisfied with but there is uh, one thing is clear that quite a large uh, number of failures occurring in practice due to software can be dealt with by means of restart or failover to an identical copy and things of that nature and so the only way to explain that uh, would be that these uh, failures were caused by Mandelbox because 15 20 years ago if you told people that it will be okay to fail over to an identical standby or restarting a uh, uh, piece of software might well work without uh, under the same set of inputs. So I think we need to concentrate more on that and we are beginning to collect data of failures during operation and try to mo uh, more understanding of this phenomena and this will lead to uh, better recovery techniques uh, during operation. I will, in a way, go with Pete's line uh, of thinking. Uh, software reliability engineering originated in mission critical systems and uh, traditional telecommunication systems where high reliability and availability are uh, a requirement. Uh, but uh, it seems that these days and times uh, there is so many other roads to take and uh, expand uh, software reliability engineering to. Uh, just think of a cell phone. We, we don't own phones anymore. We carry computers with us and they fail. I have to reboot my phone after a while, as uh, Kishore was saying. Uh, they fail a lot and just as an example, uh, my old Android phone wasn't very <laughs> The point is because the driver for that specific uh, phone hardware wasn't communicating well with the operating system. So how we really deal in a uh, situation where there, are, there is open source uh, uh, vendor software, different hardware, different configurations, uh, apps that run on different gadgets, just to uh, give some examples. So I think there's many more different opportunities and many different types of software reliability activities. Uh, in these days and times with all the fast technology developments. So I actually just want to add to what Katarina said. I mean, think about the phone itself. Before we never had to worry about power consumption. Now reliability is actually a trade-off with power. If you have infinite power, you can do a lot of things. But your phone doesn't have infinite power. It's not plugged in. So what's the trade-off between availability of energy and reliability? Another vastly expanding area which reliability has not really touched about is games. So I recently read an article which basically said that games have now overtaken the revenue from movies. They actually contribute more in terms of revenue turnover and profit compared to what movies contribute to the economy. There's very little availability or reliability work on games. But there have actually been several articles that you know gamers are the most unforgiving customers. I mean, you possibly know if you play 16 levels and then the game crashes, you're not going to be happy because you're going to start again from level one. So how do we actually, you know, 
look at availability of games which are vastly networked because it actually brings about a further problem. Nobody likes playing on their own. You play across the network with someone else. So how do you talk about availability and reliability in that area? The entire notion of reliability actually changes. So for example, the game might still be running, but if it actually doesn't do what the customer expects it to do, that is defined as a failure in the game industry. So, you know, broadening our horizons to embrace the newer and emerging areas of software development would be something we should think about. So I just want to add to that, that I think we need to think about reliability issues for the younger generation, which basically is worried about connectivity all the time and they're almost glued to their iPhones and if that doesn't work, then they're really upset about it. So games uh, and, and networking and texting. And the other thing I wanted to say is that, at least in the academic world, we need data. We need data from the industry that we can actually mine and look at uh, to figure out where the failures are occurring, what types of failures are occurring, and that's the way we can drive the models for better predictions. That's one thing that is definitely if we don't have. So, those are two things that I would like to add. The thing that I see is that, is that since I first got interested in this area back in, well, uh, back in 1985, uh, it's, uh, it, uh, this, this whole area seems to have gone from, from being, being an intellectual curio uh, curiosity uh, to, to, uh, to, to, uh, to a really legitimate concern, both, uh, both for researchers and, 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 for, and for practitioners. When I, when, I, when, I, when I first got interested, uh, in trying, in, in trying to apply some of these techniques, uh, the, uh, the, the, the development organization for, uh, for, uh, for which I was working uh, was, um, uh, didn't say so in quite so many words, but, but, but was wondering what, it, what, what was this crazy thing that I was trying to do and that I, and that I should stick to doing real work. Uh, I'm, ex I'm, I'm exaggerating a little bit, but not, but not very much. Uh, where, whereas, it, whereas in the, inter, in, in the intervening years, we, we have seen more and more of these techniques um, in, in, uh, encapsulated in the tools, uh, being, being adopted by real development organizations. For example, at JPL, there are, uh, there, there are people responsible for, for developing uh, critical pieces of software such as, uh, such as their ground-based uh, navigational uh, systems. Uh, who, who use uh, software reliability assessment techniques to to uh, to manage uh, the, to manage their uh, development efforts, make predictions about how many uh, failures they're going to encounter over the next year, and uh, and and uh, are able to make pretty accurate estimates of what the maintenance budget is going to look like, and, and, and are able to look ahead to 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 the, to the Number of problems that they're going to be observed during the colors. and that's and that's something that uh, I think would be pretty helpful. Some of the legitimacy it derives uh, also from uh, from the point that from uh, what Swapa was saying about the availability of data over the intervening years, we we've been able to accumulate a large uh, repository of uh, of uh, failure data across the industry, and at the same time. Uh, compute cycles uh, have gotten cheap enough, and, uh, and, to, and tools have gotten capable enough, so we are now starting to be able to take a lot of the unstructured information that's contained in those reports, uh, that is the descriptive text that tells you about uh, what, what type of failure, or, you know, what the failure behavior was, what was done to correct it, and so on and so forth. That, that we can that we can actually and that we can actually do meaningful analyses of that unstructured information, where it was not so terribly long ago, uh, that would have been very difficult to do. So, so we're getting better insights into the types of uh, defects that we put into the software, what types of failures we experience, uh, what the most promising areas for developing repair techniques look like, and so forth. Uh, that that seems to that seems to be the biggest change for me though. Uh, the, uh, the, uh, that, 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 that this that this whole that this whole area has gained has gained has gained the legitimacy in the uh, uh, both in both the research community and especially in the industrial community. Tom, I I 
I think that new technology uh, uh, has a way of creeping into becoming critical, part of our critical infrastructure. And he talked about that from heat and, and games and, and the, the phone. But I'm unaware of a service level agreement that I could sign that would guarantee my phone would be operable. Uh, so I, I think that, you know, and if I was, how much would I pay for it? It seems to be a pretty open-ended question. And soon we're going to find that someone has built the cell phone into some critical infrastructure, and people are going to die because it doesn't work. And I think that's an area of research that maybe we haven't, uh, haven't pushed on very much. I'm interested in your comments on whether you think that's going to be true. I, I totally agree with you because a lot of games these days are used in the Army and the Air Force for simulation. I mean, most of the flight training actually takes place on simulators before they go on the actual planes. A lot of that is actually based on, well, I won't put them as games, they're flight simulators, but you can actually buy copies of it as a game and still play on it. So, definitely, I think this is going to happen probably very soon, but there's been very little research on this. So, you know, how much are we willing to pay for that? Is my real I agree with you. When we used to have fixed phones, the, the requirements for unavailability was three, less than three minutes per year. And then we got these cellular phones and we accepted the situation to have an availability of four, five, or ten hours per year. So now, that we have accepted it, I think that it would be very hard to, to go back and to ask for some requirements and some service level agreement. But we do something, I agree. We yeah, in fact, senior level service used to be something that people tried to attain, right? From, yes, from the, uh, it was very high, really, because three minutes per year it was, and it was written, it was requirement for telecommunication systems. Now nobody talks about this because it is not in, uh, in minutes, it is not in hours, it is in day, I think, in days. Same thing is true of cloud. You won't find any real service level agreement uh, based on cloud now. Mm, I think that for cloud it will come maybe because there is business working on this. For telecommunication it is different because users are more and myself or all of us working on this and we accepted it because it is very convenient, we are happy that our children have these cellular of phones and so on. So once we have accepted it, now going back maybe... So isn't that similar to the uh, reliability of mainframe operating systems and then Windows came? <laughs> yes, yes, yes. It's part of food every day. Well, well, my <laughs> wife switched from T-Mobile to Verizon because T-Mobile was dropping her and Verizon had a better reputation, so I think this this progression from uh, nice to have to, to absolutely necessary is going to follow that same route. So you, you think market see? forces are going to make this happen? And Windows got better, but it took two decades. I don't think it'll. I think we're accelerating way faster than that these days. You know, I think it's going to be in the next several years we're going to have. Very high reliability standards for things like that. I, I, I just wanted to add a comment with respect to cell phones and, and differences of the model things have done. If you take Apple and iPhone, there's much less malware for iPhone because they have very stronger control over what gets into their app store, and also it's almost next to impossible for a regular user to download something that's not there. Uh, they have control over all the drivers that go with their phones, so their phones are much more responsive and better than if you take an Android phone that deals with uh, not just open source operating system, uh, but also deals with many different hardware platforms, many different drivers, many different apps, and most of the malware is written for Android phones. So it's, it's, it's not just guarantees, but it's also the model that, that is taken and uh, share of the market that, that is there, that, that really tells you how things uh, go. If you take the mainframe cell phone and now the mobile analogy, 
the question may be that what did our community do to accelerate the reliability increases that occurred in those industries and in those platforms? So between mainframe, a lot of stuff was known, and when Windows came, it still took it two decades to accelerate, right? And uh, what did we do then? And what are we doing now, given the opportunity that you're just describing? Uh, I think it, it's market. What you have the kids that care about listening to music, playing to games, and texting. That don't care that their phone fails, and if that's the majority or part of the market, they're gonna. I don't know. It, it's, it's probably gonna get there, but it will take time. So yes, sir. I just want to comment on the. the heterogeneity of the platforms that that are out there. So I, I, I do agree that you know the, the Android or the Windows model is is much more difficult to build reliability in than say the Apple model of closed systems. But so if you go back to mission critical reliability analysis where you're really dealing with building reliability into closed systems, my question is um, do we need a new paradigm for researching and evaluating and building reliability into more open heterogeneous systems where um, you, you, there's no way in the lab you can even predict what sort of environment that your software is going to run in or, or the, the end configuration of your, your systems. Do, do we need a new paradigm for, for even understanding those types of systems? Well, I disagree with that statement. You can't predict the environment. Of course, you predict the environment. You simulate all the time and predict the environment. But then, if you feel like the system could be used in an environment that it wasn't intended to be used in, and you put that into a spec, you put it into a, uh, a warranty, and say, if you use it, if you take your cell phone and you try to use it underwater, you know, all your warranty is void. So you have to say, what's the intended application and what's the intended environment? And then, wrap your reliability requirements around that. Remember, reliability is the performance over time under stated conditions. Uh, if, you, if you've got an environment though, like, um, like, a, like, a, um, um, like a, like a, like a file that you're managing, and, and you, and you are, and you are running a, and you are, and you are, are running a mix of, of, uh, of, 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 of application services on this thing, it's, it's going. It's going to much. It's going to be much more difficult to predict what that environment is going to look like and how all these different components interact. So I. So I think. So I think. So I think in that sense we're going to, we're going to need a better understanding of uh, of of what of, of what of what's of, you know, what, what sorts of things people people are interested in running. What you know what. What possible types of interactions may look like if we can even develop some sort of categorization, uh, and, that, and that's and that's going to be a very interesting thing. I think I think in the general case that may be that may be an insoluble problem, but there there may be enough cases that we can get some useful information. Uh, Lorenzo, I think these last four or five statements could be summarized into something like. There are two directions for working on reliability in this systems becoming more open. And one is to focus more on the robustness of the, of the systems when used in unexpected ways. And the other one is to understand a lot more what people are going to do with the systems. There is include a lot more statistical prediction of these funny things people use us than we do now. And the two are not mutually exclusive. Yes, sir. Can I take the liberty to uh, steer the conversation? To, uh, to Please. Topic? Yeah. So uh, I'm Sagar Sen. I come from similar research in Norway. Okay. So I work with the e government systems. Mm -hmm. So um, the e government systems in Norway are very transparent in the sense that the backs paid by everyone that's online. So can you speak up? <coughs> <laughs> so, um, Norway has a very transparent uh, government, e government system. I work, for instance, with the Norwegian Public Customs Department, and in the past, we worked with the Norwegian Tax Department. So, um, they, they publish all the data in terms of uh, 
who can for salary and how much tax he pays online. So you can just look for the name of a person on Google and you will see how much tax he pays. Really? Yes. <laughs> so this kind of is his income also? Yes, yes everything is. Not your own society. <laughs> 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 But this kind of initiative yeah, is uh, quite uh, <laughs> rampant in Europe. So the real-time information of uh, transportation of buses. All that is available now. Now, this also means that there is a possibility of uh, scandals breaking up in case there is a problem with computation of uh, computing taxes. So if someone detects that there is a problem in what uh, Tax list has to pay, then uh, this this kind of uh, information can go really viral very fast. Uh, the reputation of the government is at stake. So my general question to the panel is: uh, What do you think in terms of uh, software reliability are the challenges for this open data revolution? See. I don't know if it's uh, happening in the US. In the US, I don't know. My colleagues uh, next door, his salary is all. One of the reasons they do this is to reduce corruption and many other things you can imagine. So I think it's a good thing. <laughs> so I think that in this situation, users, the users of the software are human. The number of people working on this. But you can look at your neighbors. Uh, yes, you can uh, look, but uh, what are the operations I am saying? They, you will not you don't do mean anything, that just look. Data. You can create infographics out of it or uh, something else, but uh, it's just online available. Yes, it is an online available for looking. So there are the you, people uh, have interfaces for this kind of data for you to be able to do something with it. Like real time transportation. Uh, you can do a lot of things. So we okay. don't know how it's going to be used and what will happen if there is an error in this kind of thing. So this is a, a challenge for us because we are trying to understand sort of like the social reliability of the data. Yes, but I was trying to understand what are the functions of these systems to check how is this used? It's new. Uh, Go ahead. Yeah. I think this uh, open tax system has been there for a long, long time, so we're all very used to it. But the real problem this past spring came when, and another thing is that security is quite highly pro um, profiled in Norway. So authentication to this system is very, it's quite good. It's, I would say, a sufficient level of two-factor authentication. However, once in, what happened in the spring is once you got into the system, there were so many bugs in the software, in fact, 3,500 bugs in the software, that um, whatever, I don't, whatever happened is that one poor guy's tax return Guinness. was displayed for everybody who went into the, who logged into the system. <laughs> so they have great security but lousy um, uh, control over the reliability of the software. So that's a, that's a big issue, I think. Yeah, cer certainly, 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 in a case like that, you're going, you're going to need to pay. You're going to need to pay spe uh, special attention to to, uh, to the reliability aspects, and, uh, and, it, and in, in, or in order to, in order to do that, there's there's going, there's going to have to be agreement across the, um, uh, across the whole society of, of what of what, the, of what the system is actually supposed to do. So, so the so the requirements are go, are going to have to be um, complete and unambiguous, and all of these other good things, and that's and that's where and that's where you start intersecting with the with the with, with the uh, political and social aspects of the whole thing, which I don't I don't think we're doing that yet in this country, although we're although we're probably going to bump up against it. <coughs> With the with the with the push to uh, 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 computerize uh, health records, now we have now we have taken a couple of steps in in in, in that direction of specifying what information is going to be available under what circumstances with with um, with, with laws like uh, HIFA, which 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 are the health record uh, the health record privacy acts. 
but uh, but in, but in addition to the to, to the technical aspects of, of the reliability of the software, there is going to have to be uh, to to be a much greater long term focus on on, de on, de on developing uh, uh, laws that are analogous to HIPAA to so that the, so that the developers are so that the developers of these systems are going to know what they're supposed to do and what they're supposed to avoid. I mean, this gets into a whole interesting area that, that we are going to get into. Um, Actually, oh, pardon me. Um, I'm going to make a statement, and I'd like some people's reaction to this. Um, I think that uh, the whole software area has, for decades, missed the boat. Uh, thinking back, some of the early successes in hardware reliability were due to gathering data. There was a data book of failure rates called Mill Handbook 217, about two, two and a half inches thick, that everybody swore at and told <coughs> these don't hold and this, uh, this is uh, uh, perhaps wrong and so forth, but everybody used. And everybody used that as a starting point for part where we were the <laughs> estimates. And they really wrote down numbers. And then they tried to refine the numbers. And uh, for many, many years, uh, uh, I know a number of people have spoken out, couldn't there be a software reliability database? The first one in hardware was the military. And the military sponsored this and spent a lot of money, and I think they still do. Nowadays, uh, the military is not so much uh, in the area of standards, collecting data and so on. They're leaving it to professional societies, to companies. And I think companies do not collect for open use. Maybe they collect for their own use, this, that. And uh, I, I'd like some of you to uh, disabuse me uh, and tell me, yes, this data does exist. Well, I think that the main assumptions in the military handbook, the main assumption is that the failure rate depends, heavily depends, on the technology yeah. and the environment. And they have adjusted some factors, tuning factors, to sure. adapt it. Now, the question is, can we say that the failure rate of the software is also heavily related to the language used, to the way it is tested. This means that we have to adjust this. This is the main thing. Yes. But uh, I have a feeling if you took and reported 10 different telecommunication systems <laughs> that serve similar functions, reported their number of slots, how they were developed, their language, uh, 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 what standards were used in the development, you'd find more regularity than you think. Yes. It we, wouldn't be 10 different things completely different. Yes. It would be yes. some. Number one and five and seven would be I did it. I did it for several switching systems from France and Brazil. And we evaluated the figure rate of the software. But the, the, and the, there I agree with you that there are similarities. We know that it is. 10 minus 4, almost 10 yeah. minus 5, depending on the maturity of the But did you submit it to the IEEE International Database? No. Which doesn't exist? No, doesn't of exist. course. <laughs> no, of course, because it is that it does not belong to me. Yeah. Uh, I have worked for other uh, companies, telecommunication companies. So we were allowed to show it at the beginning, but not at the end. So this is one of the difficulties for the yeah. so The reason that this worked was the military wrote into the, all their contracts as part of the contract you must collect and report the data and of course the data belonged to the military and if they said you had to report it you reported it and there, there's no effort like that yeah. they started the effort with john user remember john user collected the data at least published the work uh, for air, from air ABC, air ABC Center. 
where in which uh, he collected data on 15 uh, software systems. And he started, it was a, a good starting point in 79, and then it's, he stopped. It did, it did. Yes. Well, okay. My company uses the concept. <coughs> My company uses the concept of hardware reliability classes to do the kinds of things that MIL 217 does, yes. and, it's, it does it, and it works very well, so we're in the process of, of trying it out in the software reliability class space to <coughs> aggregate different software type products, like you say, functionally, where it, where it lives in the network, what it does, speeds and feeds are about the same kind of parameters around it, and hopefully we can uh, estimate what best in class needs to be for each for each class and then publish that data at some point to to, to the community so that competitive product even competitive products can be compared to what we think is best in class and that sort of thing. Would would you really publish it uh, rather than consider it private data for your own benefit? That's that's a big step. That you use data for your own benefit. That you would really publish it to the open community? I believe so. That would be very I don't, I don't see how that could be of any value. Because 217 is based on homogeneous samples, lots of them, volume, right? A resistor model is only there because there's millions of them made, right? So, what's the sources of variability? Very small when you're building a, a resistor compared to building a system or writing software. So software, really, all of its sources of variability are very dependent on who did the code or who designed that software, who wrote the requirements. And it, it changes from, from person to person. So you almost have to have a model for each software developer. And I, I don't see how that would be of any value. Not, but we have, we have models that work pretty well generically across different product families. But you don't push it out of the same computer, the same machine process like you do with parts, okay, right? Just so variability sources are too great and they're very important <coughs> on the human where the machine can control the process. If, if you have thousands of releases or, you know, <laughs> I mean, the products, we're doing auto code generation on everything, then yes, it's possible. But yeah. until it's, you know, you get the human out of the coding loop, so it's not going to be dependent on human error. And, and the fact that you got a good compiler and a good load checker and a good, you know, code walkthrough process, you know, you're going to have too much sources of variability. Yes, it makes sense to track the failure rates of your software, but that's really for your internal purposes, not to be shared with the rest of the industry. I think that, so I, think, I agree, fully agree with you, but this is, this variability is very high during development, validation, and before operation, or at the beginning. And I think, and I then hope that uh, when the system is in operation, highly used, you will, will, the impact of this variability will be really low. I expect it for uh, when the software is mature. And we can do it looking for the results and not looking at the details during development. But really, uh, when the software is usage by several people. Can I just put, put some realism in this? I work for a number of computer companies. We always produce exactly these specs the way we did it. We started with the answer. We got the data, whatever the data is. It's fiddled on those things which you added complexity, you added everything else. We always got the answer we want. It was, yes. a, it was a complete joke. So the government liked these figures. We gave them the figures the government liked. But to be honest, it was it, it, the, the idea that that reflected reality was just, it did. Yes, but what you just said is, dishonesty is easy to do. Honesty is very hard, and you have to very, work very hard to get some data and to be honest with yourself. No, and it's easier to take the, the easy route, which is dishonest. The spec is dishonest because yeah. basically the spec assumed there was no driver software in the system. The system had driver software and it just didn't address that whole thing. So, so the hardware world, probably back in the 1930s, may have been a bit more accurate in the reliability figures. But to be honest, I don't think the hardware world can teach software <coughs> a lesson. I think they were just 
all they did was they had they had pretend models. We just don't have models, so we're probably more truthful than the hardware industry. I think we're confusing two things here. There is a manufacturing business and there's a development business. And every manufacturing business also has a development cycle that precedes it. In the hardware world, we're looking at, when you're talking about reliability and so forth, you're looking at the effects of manufacturing. And manufacturing is a step and repeat process. You assume that the design is fine, you're not assuming design flaws, you're looking at what comes out. Whereas in software development, we're really only dealing with development issues. There is no manufacturing fallout. If, if so, it's very, very small. You know, there are build errors, that's, that, that can probably lead to some kind of manufacturing. So when we use these uh, comparisons, we, can, we easily uh, confuse these two issues. Now, it is true that if you had fairly competitive developers, like in the telco industry, where there's a fine if you have outages, then they all try to ramp up their reliability to meet some target, and you may be able to effectively compare supplier A to supplier B. And given that they all had a best effort in their development, there is meaning in that number that comes out in failure rate. But if you take some other industries, which are really, um, they are really monopolistic. If you look at our software industry, it's a very monopolistic business. It's, it's very rare that you find two of them competing in the same space, except maybe in some application area. So Microsoft really didn't have a competitor in a major way for a couple of decades. So it's hard to take that product and compare it against another, because the market dynamics are different. So I think, but I think there is value in all this analysis. But we should be careful that we should not compare manufacturing and development so easily. And we should know what the trade offs are. I just wanted to add something along the lines. Uh, it, uh, it's also understanding better uh, the nature of software faults and failures, not just necessarily to give numbers to them. I don't think that we really know enough because of the complexity of the whole process and because of the there's a lot of data available, but the data that is collected in, uh, it's never collected for what we try to mine it. I've worked with open source, I've worked with uh, uh, mission critical data. It's, it's not readily available. It takes a long time to make sense of the data. And I don't think that we have reached the state where we know what are the intrinsic characteristics that go across the board versus what is uh, project, product, domain specific. Uh, a, a simple example, software uh, faults that lead to one failure often uh, tend to be spread across multiple files or components. And uh, we happen to check that that applies to NASA software as well as to GCC compiler and percentages are very similar. So how we use that to develop better software, to do better fault injection, to do better predictions, uh, if we assume simple faults, simple mutations, we are never going to reach the state of maybe making our software better if we don't know how and why it fails. It is not always putting a number, it's also understanding the mechanisms behind the failures. Um, so, uh, so I, I'm Mark Hayes from the University of Kentucky, and I help teach some of the software engineering courses there. As my question for you is, um, what, what's the most important thing we can teach in the students so when, the, when they go to the industry to develop the product? <laughs> Actually, if software engineering course is actually able to simulate how a real software engineering project works, that will be the best thing. So, a lot of times software engineering courses basically say, hey, you're going to build this thing. That really isn't how an engineer is going to work when they come in for a company. They're going to build on top of something that already exists. It's never a V1 system. So, if you have an open source project, ask them to build a feature on top of it, that will basically help them understand how they have to interwork with other people's code how they have to actually deal with prior bugs, how they have to fix code they're not familiar with. Those things are actually real life things that they're being definitely an asset when they come to work in the industry. So I actually have a project at UConn which basically addresses exactly the issue that you said and we're trying to integrate open source software into software engineering to teach them how to do maintenance and code comprehension and then at the end of it they have to implement an enhancement to the project of their choice. 
So they work with the project through the semester, they work on understanding it, they work on uh, extracting the design decisions. And uh, it's been a very interesting experience for two years. It's been very rough on the students, they hate us for it because um, uh, basically the open source code that we get is not documented, <coughs> sometimes the documentation is in a foreign language. But at the end of it, they come away saying that, okay, I agree that I have to document my code well. This is a lot of work. It's very difficult. But uh, I think they learn what they're supposed to learn. So, uh, so yeah, open source software is a very good resource that we can look into and integrating how, how to look into how to teach these, these exact skills that they need as to work from somebody else's code. That's the main thing. They're not going to build something from scratch. That's I think that they, I think at, uh, at uh, USC they do, they do something similar with the software engineering course. Uh, they, they'll, they'll, work, they'll work with different organizations on campus, the library or, or, or somebody else, uh, to, 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 build, to, to build a system uh, that, that will do something. And, and this has been around a lot of now that, 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 there, that there's going to be an existing system. To which, they make modif to which they make modifications or add new features or something, so you're going to get the same, you're going to get that same um, uh, experience that you're working with open source, plus you get the benefit of having uh, direct contact with, it, with, with with a customer too, who may or may not know what they want, or, or, cha or, or, cha or change their minds, or say at the last minute, well, could, could, you, could you put this out there, we would really like to see it. So, I, so, so I did. So, so I, so I agree. Working, working with, <coughs> working with, working with, uh, with something as close as you can to a real system and and and, 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 and real customers is going to be very helpful. And one thing I'll just add is I've always really been impressed when schools actually don't allow students to self-select, and they actually assign teams because in reality you can never self-select who you work with. You have to work with a team. One person can be difficult. How you get along with that person is part of learning. So thinking about software reliability and the importance of predicting the future, because that's really what it's about. It's not just doing a statistical analysis of what we have today, but how likely will this product perform in the future. What would you say to somebody that says, I have a single model, let's say a non-homogeneous Poisson process based on the power law, and that's the only model that should be used to predict uh, software reliability. I would I would tell them that my experience has been that that uh, that 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 different that uh, for different projects for for different systems even if they're of the same type uh, the same uh, the same model uh, may not may not uh, may not work from one to the other. And the, and the other thing, and the other thing that you want to do is that, is that even during during the development and testing effort, you you you, you preference it, uh, your model preferences might change. For instance, uh, your your uh, one of your NHPP models might be performing well during the early part of testing, but but but, but, later, but, but later on it's going to produce uh, predictions that are consistently optimistic. Let's say. So, so at that, so at that point, then uh, there will be another model that will give you much more, much more accurate predictions. Now, there, now there's there, there's lots of ways, as we all know, of 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 identifying which model is going to be most appropriate at any, at any given time. But but uh, but but some but somebody who made that claim to me, uh, I I would. That that is that is not a generally applicable point, and it might work. It might work within their own organization, but but I but I would be very interested in knowing uh, from what from what data they will make that determination. How is the data, uh, how is the data measured? How uh, how much do they have over you know, uh, over what types of projects was it collected? Uh, what what does it mean? Can they identify the sources of noise and so forth? It's, yeah, this is, I, I don't. I, I don't. I don't think that. I don't think that this is a reasonable point to make. There, there's a lot of commonality um, among teams across a, an organization, but there's always elements that are aspects that are different. 
you know, some teams are weaker in this area or stronger in another, uh, despite all that commonality, maybe two-thirds commonality, one-third specificity. So the, the being able to generalize a model across the entire spectrum is, too, is, is normally way too ambitious. The, there may be two or three or four types of models that will apply in a large organization, and you really have to fit it to that, that specific development environment, or you, you can, your, your, your accuracy can go way off, and you can, you can miss a practice that's very deficient or a practice that's very, very good shape. Just a, a model works well if its assumptions are true, are realized. And I think that it is good to test the assumptions before applying the model. Having that, uh, said this, what kind, what is the precision we are expecting from these models? When we talk about hardware, we say the failure rate is almost 10 minus 4. It could be 1, it could be 3, it could be 5 minus 4. So the precision is from 1 to 5. Are we expecting more from the software? If we are not expecting more, if we need to have just an order of magnitude, I think we can use high-level model and have this figure. If we are looking for precision, I don't think that we can use only one model. But I think we have to think about the expectation when using these models. I think uh, we are still talking about during development. We need more data of software failures during operation. And I have worked with some companies, uh, not Microsoft, but uh, they, they, this data doesn't, uh, is uh, not available, not analyzed, and so on. So I think we need a lot, lot more emphasis on data during operation. And all we have been talking about so far is during development. Uh, so I yeah, but there's a very limited amount of data, I think. Uh, we need a lot more data out in knowledge. Right now, uh, there's been reported a lot of errors in the informatic system uh, of uh, Ford Company products. The system that connects you through Bluetooth with the cell phone and plays music and does various other things. And uh, they, which was actually uh, written by Microsoft for Ford, uh, they uh, have uh, have new releases and so on. Suppose uh, when they make me president of Ford Motor Company, I decide that Ford is going to develop it themselves, a new system, five years from now. Would I think of trying to do that without going back? looking at the data from the old system and seeing how often it failed. This is operational data that you're talking about. Why it failed, uh, what percentage was users confused, what percentage was the system failed. You, you need to set. Yet uh, I see so many people who start out as if this was the first time this was ever done. Don't look at all that. But it's hard to collect this data. But you need this as a basis for where to go. Otherwise, uh, you keep reinventing the wheel. It's not <coughs> or operating in the, in the dark, basically. Yes, of course, of course. Which is okay, you know. <laughs> yeah. You're doing it, so why not? Well, actually, there's just one, one issue also that comes up with uh, the data collection process in operational environments. There is a balance between security, reliability, and privacy. So a lot of times cell phones actually cannot monitor where people are. So when crashes take place, it's not possible to send crash data back on phones because people actually pay for that bandwidth plan. So if I have a 200 MB bandwidth plan, do I really want to send back crashes and use my bandwidth plan for it? So there are lots of questions that come about. And then you cannot collect geolocations. I mean, in the European Union, they have very strict laws about what can be stored, what cannot be stored, what has to be crushed up. So, working through that actually creates another problem when you start directly dealing with customers. And of course, there are other issues too, but that how we store that data becomes a challenge. Yeah. And this is a huge problem, of course, but 
you know, I, I believe the hardware data was collected by uh, taking devices and subjecting them to failures uh, <coughs> in labs. And we can do something similar for software, but somebody has to invest. I remember I, I worked with I, IBM uh, uh, for the SIP uh, web sphere analysis, and uh, all data for hardware was available, but none of the data for software was available. So, uh, but the, the system was, uh, the model was helped to sell the system. And then I told IBM that this is for the missing piece. And I have idea how to conduct experiments. Then we conduct experiments. And it was extremely difficult. The, the thing is so. Now, why, why do you worry about this? There is no interest in investing a little bit of money to try to, uh, try to get some light on this problem. And so maybe somebody is listening somewhere, either in DOD or com companies. There is, I mean, the well, next quarter. Is, I don't want to spend a dime more than what is necessary. So who cares so, about so, so uh, you know the from a uh, DOD point of view or from a Raytheon point of view? We're tracking all causes of system failure, right? So anything that comes back, I'm sure companies do this as well in the commercial world because if you have a warranty return. You're going to track all the causes of why you had a return, right? So you start at the top level. You say, why did this item come back? So you do your root cause analysis, and then you separate out between was the root cause related to hardware, was the root cause related to software, and then how do I fix it? After you do the root cause analysis, what did I do to correct it? So I might have a system failure related to hardware that I fixed with software, or a system failure that's related to software that I fixed with hardware, or a system failure related to software that I fixed with software. So those kinds of conditions you can track, right? If you're doing your job to prevent returns, you know, and, and preventing recalls, then you're going to do all that due diligence to figure out what's the cause and can I prevent this from happening again. So I think the data exists, it's just very tightly held it's proprietary. Nobody wants to share that with the public. But I'll tell you that there has been opportunities in the past where, say, RAC, the uh, Reliable Analysis Center, which is now called RIAC, they <coughs> were doing something called the Data Sharing Consortium. They, sh they asked companies to share the raw data with them, and they would obfuscate the data in terms of the pedigree, they would kind of classify it in terms of what kind of system did it come from. But lose all traces to who provided it, when it was provided, you know, what the company name was, what was the program name, what was the system name. They didn't care about that. They just cared about what was the root cause. So how much hours on this kind of a system led to these kinds of failures, and here's the percentages and the distributions of that data. I think that data can be available. Um, some, of it, some of it is going to be easier to, to, to get a hold of than the other stuff. What, what we, we, we've got an institutional problem reporting system at JPL, for instance, but it, would, you know, it wasn't really de designed to do any, 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 any trending analysis. It, it was simply designed to track individual problems from, from, their, from, their, from, their, from their initial observation through to completion and make sure that everything was properly dealt with by the time we launched the thing. Um, and then, and, then there, and then there's the issue of the ancillary data that you need, in this case, how is it operated? And that's going to be recorded in different repositories uh, that, that, may or, that may or may not be, be well designed. That's, uh, that's, another, that's another issue, too. I think we have time for maybe, for maybe one more topic before we, be, before we go to get a refill on coffee. Uh, yes, sir. I'm, I'm, I'm wondering, uh, since the, the case of video games is a, is a very clear example of uh, that uh, developers don't have time sometimes to fix everything, they just release the, the, the software. Uh, so I, I'm wondering, what is the state uh, for different industries uh, which you're uh, acquainted with in terms of uh, the prioritization of the bugs that have to be solved before the deployment versus uh, which kinds of bugs are left for later, and what kinds of failures are deployed and are considered uh, tolerable. Can you comment on that? What, what we've discovered is that the old-fashioned way of fixing, fixing all set ones and you know ninety, you know all the ten or twenty set twos and, and all that before you release a product. 
is uh, can be can be counterproductive actually. Uh, several companies, ours included, have have figured out that if we uh, identify, if, if, if we form a, uh, a cross-functional team of, of engineers that are that maybe located on the customer sites, and then the engineering team, and then the product team, we can do a pretty good job of triangulating on those defects that really are operationally impacting for customers. So if, if you put a little extra time in the bug scrubbing part of the process, you can actually complete the bugs that the customer is likely to experience. Uh, there are many, many, many bugs the customer will never see over the whole the lifetime of the, of the product. Uh, so if you fix too many of those, you get a regression rate that offsets the benefit you get from fixing the box, so you know, collateral damage rate. So that's one method that uh, I think is being used more and more these days in, in our company to, uh, to really put some more thought up front into what we're fixing and, uh, and when we're fixing them. Uh, of course, you don't want to fix them too late prior to, prior to releasing. So, so there are parameters around when you fix them, what to fix, and uh, uh, the results are pretty good if you, if you, if you put a, a process around that. Uh, I think that brings us to the end of, um, of this last panel of the conference. Thank you, everybody, for participating. Thank you very much to our panelists.